Greetings in the great name of Jesus. So glad to have you tune in with us here at WOLW Television Studios. This is Pastor Walter Turner with Faith in Christ Church. We're located at 5735 North Galt Avenue in beautiful Fort Payne. I do want to extend an invitation for you to come and to worship with us. Our services are Wednesdays beginning at 6, to 6 o'clock. We have a regular worship and and uh, ministering service on Wednesdays, and just as I said, it's 6 o'clock. Then on Saturdays, we have Bible study. <clears throat> Our Bible study begins at 1045 and usually lasts till about 1130. Then we take a break, and then service starts at 12 o'clock. Regular service starts at 12 o'clock. Saturdays, Saturdays it is. And again, I'd like to extend that invitation out to you. Come be with us. If you don't have a church, it's of a necessity that you find the house of God. But that's the particular subject I want to minister on today is about the house of God. Because a lot of times it seems in our society now how that the house of God is considered of very little importance. But it's a significant thing that we worship and attend, assemble ourselves together, don't fail to do it as is the manner of some, and knowing the purpose as to why do we go to the house of God. It isn't just to show up, but it is to go and to serve God. 
And then to be in the midst of God's people. Man, it's a beautiful thing. Have that type of relationship. Have that type of heart and love being expressed to God first and then to one another. And it's, it's an absolutely beautiful thing. Going into the presence of the Lord, elevating your mind from the cares of this life, you can't do it everywhere. But I guarantee you, come to this house, Faith in Christ Church, you'll find that the presence of God is there to help you, to deliver you, to comfort you, and to meet every need that you have, to give you some joy and some peace. We're getting ready to go into, go into the Word of God in just a moment, but I do want to urge each and every one of us, pray. Pray for revival. Pray for our nation. I know for the last year or so I've emphasized about praying for revival, but seemingly we cannot emphasize it enough. The only thing that is going to turn this situation around in our nation is that we pray. Put it in the hands of God. And we as Christians, this is something that I want the Christians to know. We are obligated. We are obligated to stand in the gap in circumstances like this and to call upon the Lord and to ask for his intervention. We cannot put our dependency in man but we can rely upon the fact that God hears and answers our prayers. And for the sake of our nation, for the sake of our families, for the sake of our communities, for the sake of preservation, we need to seek God until we find him. Call on him until he draws near and reveals and manifests himself and begins to break this darkness and drive these spirits of hatred, bigotry, evil, murder, all of these things out of the midst of us and we can see the hand of God, the glory of God being manifested in our sight. We need the Lord today, church. People of God, we need the Lord. So let us go before God, getting our minds just upon him and setting our affections upon him. And some people might say, well, I don't know if God can do it, but the Bible said it. He can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. By the power of God that worketh within us. So it tells me if we pray, we can move God. And we can get what we have need of. Father, we do thank you for your love. Thank you for the price that you have paid. Thank you for sending deliverance and help into this world, Lord. Thank you for giving us the answer through you, Christ Jesus. We are dependent upon you today as we approach the throne of grace and we repent of sin, Lord. The very element, the thing that separates mankind from you. We repent and ask thy forgiveness. Lord, any sin, whether it's acts of omission or acts of commission. However, we have committed any sins. We ask you, Lord, to forgive and to wash us in the precious blood. That that you shed at Calvary that has never lost its power. Power to remit power to forgive, power to make us clean. And today we come seeking and standing in the gap for this nation, for the president, for leadership throughout this country. And I ask you, God, to do it because I know that you began at the heart. Thank you, Lord, for being a God that searcheth and knows the heart and the intention of every individual. And today we need a heart cleansing. We need heart transformations, changes. Lord, to where you would create in men and women a clean heart. And that you would renew the right spirit, which is a righteous and a holy spirit, into the lives of individuals. God, have your way today. Give revival to this nation. Let the men and the women of God stand up with boldness. Anoint us. Anoint us in your presence. Anoint us with your power. Anoint us in your authority authority to preach your word, the ability to stand and to withstand and to overcome everything that we're faced with. Lord, you have made us more than conquerors through you and you are with us and we give you honor and we give you praise for being the God that we read of in the word. We thank you for taking your abode in the inside of us, Lord, and having, making your habitation, our, our temples, your habitation. We ask your blessings upon everyone that is tuned in today. And I'm asking you, Lord, that you would heal those that are sick in their bodies and those that need saving, that you would grant them deliverance. 
And the Lord, the changes that we ask for, that they would come speedily. Anoint me today, Lord, as I ministered your word. Anoint us today, God, and draw people into the houses of the Lord. Lord, give me wisdom and knowledge as I seek to uh, give your people, Lord. Feed the flock of God. Nurture them up in the understanding as to why that we do what we do. We honor you and we thank you and we give you praise. For we ask these blessings in the great name of Jesus. Amen and amen. If you've got your Bibles, which I pray that you do, I'd like for you to go first of all. We're going to go to the book of Haggai. And we're going to begin to read out of the second chapter out of the book of Haggai. And in verse 3, the Bible said, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison as it is, is nothing? You know, during this time when God was dealing with this man of God and he was letting it be known to the children of Israel, when the house of God was first built, there was a glory in that house because God was in the house. The people feared God. They reverenced the Lord. And they came there to worship Him. And they realized it. But it's something about human nature. Human nature can get to the place to where it becomes more of a routine than it is in service. It's in fear. Fear tends to leave. And after a while it just becomes like a social gathering. More than it is a church. More than it is the temple where God is worshipped in. And he was asking among the people who saw it in its first glory. The Lord wanted to bring back to their remembrance how that the house of God was glorified because he was in it. And he said, and yet now be strong. I love these scriptures because God never has neglected the house of God. It's always been an ordained thing that God's people would come. First in Jerusalem, the temple was built there. And it was built for that very purpose. And people from all over the world came and worshipped in that temple that was in Jerusalem. And here the Lord began to speak and he said, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel. saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Jesedek, the high priest. And be strong, he said, all ye people of the land. Why was he telling them to be strong? Because he knew that weakness had set in. But he wanted his people to be strengthened in the fact that at his word, God speaks a thing to us. Whatever proceeds out of his mouth, if we receive it by faith, it happens to us. So as he spoke these words, be strong, my people. Strength was available for him. And he said, saith the Lord, and work. He said, for I am with you. God never sends us on a mission or a task to do something for him that he's not with us. Anything that he calls us to do, the reason that we can be successful in it is because the Lord works with us. And I'm so glad that he's the type of God that he is. There have been people that have gone on natural jobs and, and somebody was supposed to train them and teach them how to do that job. But a lot of people aren't very patient. And, and they'll maybe take just a moment or two to tell a person something. And sometimes people's comprehension doesn't work that way. And maybe it takes a little bit of time. As you work with that individual, it doesn't mean that they aren't smart. doesn't mean that they're not capable. But it just means that there's a little patience that needed. And that's the fact that I have found about the Lord. The Lord is so patient, so willing. If we put forth the effort, all he desires to see... If God can see effort out of his people, not taking him lightly, not taking his word lightly, but being active as he speaks, because our faith should operate by love. And if we love God, we're going to do what God tells us to do. And he told the people, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. He said, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so was so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. Out of everything that is going on in this world, out of all the bigotry, out of all the hatred, out of all the upsetness, malicious things that are contemplating to do to other people, the mind of Satan is operating and he's using men and women as his tools 
to get his job accomplished. Put things in their hearts and they believe what Satan says. He makes it real to them. But when God puts his word in us, he makes his word real to us. And I love the fact that the difference between us and the world is the fact that we have the love of God in us. We have the faith of Jesus Christ. And we are his elect. We are his call. No matter what takes place in this world, the good part about it, the Lord said, I'm with you. He don't want us to fear. Fear is an element, another tool of the adversary. Many times when people get fearful, they don't even think rationally. Fear will cause you to do impulsive things. Fear will, al will always cause you to hurt yourself because you're going to make a decision or do something that you do not need to do. But here, following the instructions of God, the Lord began to let them know he even went a little further back in history and let the children of Israel know that as I brought you out, brought your fathers out, and my spirit dwelled among them, and he was with them even though there were some that rebelled, some became stiff-necked, hard-hearted, rejected, didn't want to do what God said do, but God's spirit still strove with man. In our day and time, we have grace. What an abundance of grace. Is it where sin doth abound? The grace of God abounds even more. Anywhere, because the Lord knows how to keep his own. Those that are really striving, those that really have a heart to do his will, God is going to take care of us. Those that are seeking the face of the Lord, you're going to find him. As you call upon him, as you stay close to him, don't let nothing separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. No matter what takes place in life, you can't afford to find yourself without the Lord being on your side. He said, but thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once. He said, it is a little while. He said, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. The Lord troubles places. You know why? To get our attention. We get lax. We get complacent. We get at ease. Some even began to draw back. But the Lord said, I'm going to shake things. My mind goes back to 9-11. as an incident that happened in history. And we look back over the years. 9-11. Well, it was a long time back. But we saw how that the Lord shook this nation. Troubled this country. To let it know that it's not invincible. That only through the protective hand of God's mercy can we be kept. Our enemies are working fervently. Love to see the demise of this country. You know why? Because this was once a God-fearing nation. We, as of yet, we still take for granted even this liberty of being able to minister the word of God. I myself, I think on it oft times how privileged I am to live in a country to where I can come before you, a call minister of God, and to share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't take it lightly. In many countries, my life would be at stake right now and I mean, I, I, could be, I could be put to death over this very gospel. But as of yet, our nation is still allowing the freedom of speech. Being able to proclaim something. I'm not out preaching propaganda. Not out provoking evil. But this is what I want to do is provoke men and women to love. To love God first. And then to love one another. And the Lord is shaking. I'm talking about shaking. We haven't seen all of the shaking yet. Because God wants our full attention upon him. Sometimes it takes more to shake others and to bring them out of the deep sleep that they're in. Sin can bring a comatose state upon some people. But only the shaking of the spirit of God, only the moving of God's spirit can sound the alarm and cause people to awaken and recognize that the Lord is at hand. Jesus is soon to come. Get ready. Prepare, make yourself ready to meet the Lord. You might think that there are celebrities in this world and people that when you meet them, oh, you felt something you felt was so great just in their presence. But I'm going to tell you, it's nothing like coming into the presence of the Lord and being able to see him face to face. That's why the Bible describes it as a great and a terrible day. Great for the saints. What a day of rejoicing. What a day of praise. But to anybody that doesn't know the Lord, if you're half-stepping in any kind of way, 
If you feel that you can live a life and hide sin in your life, you're fooling yourself. Because there's no way that we can be sinners and be saved at the same time. We are. We have been saved by grace. So this is why we choose to live a life that is a life unto God. With a form of things the Bible tells us they're done away with. And behold, all things become new because of the light of Christ shining into our hearts, giving us understanding as to how that the Lord would purpose for us to live. He said here, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Why would the Lord speak of the riches of this world? He said, because I created everything. I made everything. I give unto whom I will. He said, there is no lack in me. I can provide. I can make provisions. I can do anything. I'm God. He said, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. I love this scripture because I take it as God speaking to the houses of God today. There is a glory I firmly believe that God is going to reveal in these latter days such as we've never seen. The houses of God are truly the houses of God. As I begin to minister and I begin to think on the scriptures, there was a man that had came to Jesus out of Matthew, out of Matthew chapter 8 and verse 20. And this man sought to be one of his disciples. He sought to go with Jesus. He sought to abide with the Lord. And he began to ask the Lord, could he do so? And the Lord began to give him this word as I go, go to this scripture. Out of Matthew 8 and 20, the Bible said, 19, I'm going to start. It said, and a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. But listen, Jesus said in 20, and Jesus said unto him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nets. He said, but the son of man hath nowhere to lay his head. Out of everything in this world, he never laid claim to a house, a place of dwelling, a place where he could call his house, property that he owns. You know, that's the American dream. I've always heard, come to America where you can have a dream of owning your own home. A place that your family could claim as their dwelling place. That could be passed from one generation to another. If you sought to sell it, you could sell it by another home. But Jesus came into this world and had no home. But when it came to the church, when it came to the house of God, I'm going to read out of Matthew 21. Out of Matthew 21 and 13. Verse 12 said, And Jesus went into the temple of God, and he cast out all them that sold and brought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, It is written, he said, My house shall be called the house of prayer. But ye have made it a den of thieves. Ain't that something how the Lord never claimed possession of a house until it came to the temple. When it came to that temple, because he gave Solomon and David the design for it, allowed them to have the ability to do so, put skillful men in every position, and they built this temple that was designed of God, made for the worship of God's people to come in and pray. No matter what the elements were, what was going on on the outside, what was taking place in the world, he wanted a place for them to be able to come and pray. And now, in the latter part of his ministry, the Lord came to that very temple and he knew I got to clean it out. He was getting ready to change the order of worship even in the temple. They sold doves. They did all of these things because animal sacrifices were being made. But the Lord knew I'm going to clean the house out as I change from one testament into another testament when I die. And he cleaned it out got rid of the thieves, got rid of everything that was not like God, everything that was out of the order of God's divine will, he cleaned the house up. And he said unto them, it is written, 
Now it, it was already written back in the days of Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied about it in Isaiah 56 and 7. And then in Jeremiah 7 and 11, he also said, This house, my house, shall be called a house of prayer. How, how significant is it that we have houses of God, churches? And I know people say, well, I can't go to every church. Every church is not the same. But if you know God, you're going to find a house of God that is going to be the house that you're supposed to worship in. God's going to give you a body that you fit in just like a piece of a puzzle. And everything you know, this is where God has ordained for you to be. And the key to it all, he didn't say that my house would be a, a house of songs. But he said my house would be a house of prayer. Where men prayed more than they did anything. I know it's good to have worshipers. I'm blessed in my church. I got talented people that can sing and are gifted and they can move you with their singing because they do it under the anointing of God as unto the Lord. Beautiful songs that minister to people. But out of everything that is done, nothing supersedes praying. Nothing supersedes the preaching of the word because in God's house, God requires that we come hear the word of God. He said, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is why by the foolishness of preaching, Jesus himself went to the temple and he taught the people. In the early days when the church was established, Peter and John went up at the certain hour of prayer. No matter what their daily activities consisted of, there was a specific time set aside that they went directly to God's house and they prayed there. I know there might be some that say, I can pray at home. But there's such a difference, can't help it. It's a good thing if you've got a prayer chamber, you've got a secret place that you talk to God. But there is something about going into God's house with a mind upon him that I'm Lord, I'm in your divine presence. Isaiah did not even come into contact with God until he came into the house of the Lord. And he said, in the year that King Uzziah died, he said, I saw also the Lord. He was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. The glory of God was in that house. And the man began to recognize, you're a prophet already. God using him, speaking things to him. But he recognized that there was something about his life that wasn't in order because he stood before all holiness, all purity, all righteousness. Everything about the Lord is pure and holy. And he saw himself in a different light. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips in the midst of a people of unclean lips. But in that house, he found help. He found that that was a place where at the altar a fire burned. And here the cherubim went and got the tongs from among the altar and took a live coal and placed upon his lips and he was purged. As I read into the New Testament, I read out of John 17 where the Lord said, Ye are now clean through and by the words that I've spoken unto you. We come to the house of God and there might be things in us that are not like him. But the more that you hear that word, that word is as a fire. And when it gets into our lives, it will consume sin. It will burn it right out of us. It will purge us to where we can live according to God's will. It's of a necessity that the body come together. When the body of Christ comes together in the order that God would have it to be, there are gifts that are in that body. Miracles, signs, wonders. God can do anything but fail. And the God that we serve is truly a miracle working God. We as of yet have not seen. We don't even understand. Sometimes I wonder do we want the depths of God's spirit to reveal to us what is the mind of the spirit. Because God wants to use some people. Not only the preacher. Not only those that sing. But God wants to use believers. People that know how to give themselves to prayer. The key to changing things in your life is to pray. Think about it. When God began to deal with you and you hear the word, what did you have to do? I had to go to the altar. And when I got to the altar, I prayed a sinner's prayer. Nobody taught me how to pray. Nobody instructed me in what to say. 
But I began to talk to God because I felt that godly sorrow, that spirit pulling on me and giving me words to say to God. And as I repented, he forgave me. Now, if God heard me when I was a sinner, surely he hears me now. God heard you as a sinner. God hears you now. And let us all learn to go to the house of God. Let us pray. Let us give ourselves unto him. Because as we let God be God, God can truly do a work in every one of our lives. I pray that this message was a blessing unto you. Thank you for tuning in today. I want you to know that we love you. We're praying for you. Do pray for us. Look forward to being here next week at the same time. God bless you in Jesus' name.